Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Tuesday, everybody. First up, two developments for the Chinese economy. We may be starting to see the first true red flag warnings that the months-long housing crisis is starting to leak into the wider financial system, risking a much more dangerous crisis mushrooming if mismanaged. Shanghai-based mega conglomerate Four Sun. Fuxing in Mandarin saw a record sell-off in dollar bonds, in what one analyst called a sign that financial stress among China's property developers is starting to spread to the country's other weaker borrowers. After Moody's Investors Services put the conglomerate on review for a downgrade last week, the firm's dollar notes lost 21%, a trend which continued into this week. Moody's cited contagion risks for China's real estate sector on Four Sun's property exposure. Quote, this sell-off is a reflection of broader wariness of potential downside in the current market environment, with many risks remaining unresolved in China and globally. I'd imagine that the aggressive downward spiral experienced in Chinese real estate remains very fresh in investors' minds, so that will likely be a factor in many investors' reaction. End quote. We will be following this space very closely. Now, the second development to cover for today is that, according to a report released yesterday, Monday, by the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China, nearly one in four European companies in China are considering shifting their investments out of the country due to disruptions caused by the zero COVID lockdowns seen across the country. Most infamously, of course, in Shanghai, some 78. Percent of respondents reported too that China's business environment has become less attractive because of the country's COVID strategy. 372 businesses responded to the survey, which was conducted in April during the Shanghai lockdown. According to the survey, the number of European firms thinking of moving their current or planned investments away from China is the highest proportion in a decade. Of the European companies considering a shift in investment, 16% said that they were considering Southeast Asia, 18% were looking at other regions in the Asia Pacific, 19% Europe, 12% North America, and 11% South Asia. The European Union ambassador to China stressed in an interview yesterday that this is about new investment and that many firms were staying in China, but companies quote are delaying decisions because everyone is waiting for an exit strategy in China for COVID restrictions. End. Quote. Hey guys, if you appreciate what I'm trying to provide here with this channel, and you would like to help keep it sustainable, Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, and crypto links are in the description below. If you're enjoying the video, don't forget to hit that like button. Thank you so much, everybody. As always, I appreciate all the ongoing support. Next up, the outbreak situations in Shanghai and Beijing both appear to be under control, with new official cases in the single digits. Of course, laziness, incompetence, or just plain bad luck could cause a resurgence and. Yet another round of damaging restrictions and lockdowns. Indeed, while there are few official cases currently, there are still sub-neighborhoods under lockdown or tight restrictions, and business restrictions, particularly for entertainment venues and restaurants, remain in place in both Beijing and Shanghai. But officials remain very much on edge across the country too. In the northeastern city of Jilin, in the province of the same name, after the discovery of just one case, the city closed all local schools and suspended public transportation for three days. Nucleic acid tests will be carried out in urban areas for three consecutive days too. A single local case in the southern mega city of Shenzhen, detected on Saturday, also triggered mass testing and neighborhood lockdowns. For some parts of the city, all of this for an illness which only resulted in less than 0.1 percent of cases in Shanghai, requiring serious hospitalizations, according to a new study authored by Zhang Wenhong, director of the National Center of Infectious Diseases, which was published by the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention over the weekend. And that research was for Shanghai and Beijing. As of Monday, the capital had registered 377 COVID-19 infections. 97.1 percent have shown no symptoms or mild symptoms, while 2.9 percent had moderate symptoms. No severe or critical cases have been reported. 
The Macau Special Administrative Region has also introduced restrictions this week with the discovery of a small cluster of cases. Next up, last week we covered the health code scandal where security and health officials in central China's Henan's provincial capital, Zhengzhou, allegedly abused the pandemic control health code system to prevent petitioners from traveling to the city to protest the freezing of their bank accounts. The scandal has grown legs and is already morphing into new forms, with a resident of Zhengzhou now suing the provincial Henan Health Commission after her health code suddenly turned yellow, restricting her from attending a court hearing on a dispute regarding the demolition of her house. According to domestic financial media outlet Tai Xin, the resident returned to Zhengzhou from Beijing, the capital, on the 9th of June to attend a court hearing scheduled for June the 13th. She said she followed virus control measures upon arrival and her health code remained green until the day of the hearing, then turned back to green after the hearing. She filed a lawsuit against the health commission over the weekend. Quote, the accusation is the latest development of a series of disclosures raising questions about the management of the province's health code system. The incidents caused a national uproar over the suspicion that local authorities were misusing a system for controlling COVID to restrict movement of some people. End quote. And finally, US China. Today, Tuesday, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which was signed into law last December, went into effect. Now, if United States customs officials identify a product as produced in whole or in part in Xinjiang or from an entity listed as linked to forced labor, the law requires importers to provide, quote, clear and convincing evidence, end quote, that goods are free from forced labor. That is, it is a rebuttable presumption. Evidence can include supply chain mapping indicating the factories or other facilities where the goods were produced, information on the workers at each facility, including on wage payments and recruitment practices, as well as audits. Industry insiders have pointed out that since Xinjiang is so tightly closed and opaque, independent auditing is not available in the region, thus fulfilling this rebuttable presumption is virtually impossible. Even though the new law only took effect today, it has already had an effect on the region's cotton and textile industry, with many downstream clients in the supply chain, especially those focusing on foreign markets already diversifying away from the Xinjiang suppliers. Cotton mills in China's far west Xinjiang are currently sitting on about 3 million tons of unsold inventory. According to the China Cotton Association, in 2021, Xinjiang's annual cotton output was 5.27 million tons, accounting for 91% of the nation's total production. That is today's episode of China Update. Thank you very much, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow.